Hello. This is the promised follow-up lecture to my undergraduate talk about affinity and efficacy, which is the first recording in the playlist, uh, which uh, I've, I've made for that purpose. And it is concerned with how to work out how many receptors are occupied and how many are active at equilibrium. This was promised at the end of the previous lecture, and here it is. It involves only the definition of equilibrium constants, so it should be well within the abilities of anyone who's done a first-year ancillary course in physical chemistry. In fact, it should really be in, in within the high school level uh, of physical chemistry. My experience, though, is that many uh, undergraduates have forgotten that stuff and they do have some difficulty in working out even the equilibrium case. This talk deals only with equilibrium. It's <coughs> not all that matters. The, if you have a, a set of receptors on a membrane which are initially unoccupied and you suddenly apply agonist concentration, then equilibrium isn't attained instantly, but it comes up slowly towards the equilibrium, more or less slowly. And uh, that can the, the time course of that can be very informative, but it's not dealt with here. It is, however, very important because in a synapse, the pulse of the agonist, the neurotransmitter, is very brief and there's no time for it to reach equilibrium in almost every case. That might or might not be the subject of another talk. Okay, so here goes. The first thing to deal with is what a, a, an equilibrium constant is. This is something from high school chemistry or first year physical chemistry course for biologists, but it's not. Um, experience has shown that people don't always remember it, so here goes. It's defined by the law of mass action. And the law of mass action is an empirical law about the rates of reactions. It says that the rate of a chemical reaction is proportional to the product of the concentration of the reactants. So it's a law about rates and the rate constants are the proportionality constants. Take a simple binding reaction. A receptor R binding a ligand A to form a complex. The rate of association is governed by the association rate constant. The rate of dissociation is governed by the dissociation rate constant. They're usually written with a lowercase k. So k minus one is the dissociation rate constant and it has units of reciprocal seconds or reciprocal time. K plus one is the association rate constant and it has units of molar to the minus one seconds to the minus one. We'll see that why that is in a moment. It's because the association rate constant is, is essentially always multiplied by the concentration of the ligand which has units of molar, so their product, K plus one times the concentration of free ligand, has units of reciprocal time, and it's this product, which is uh, the transition rate, the rate constant. It's a sort of pseudo first order rate constant. It's constant if the concentration is constant, and the fact that the concentration, free concentration of drug doesn't change with time is Im implicit in everything that follows. 
it, that should be the case at equilibrium, of course, so it's not a problem as a rule. So how do we define the equilibrium constant for a binding reaction? The binding reaction has two reactants, the number of unoccupied receptors, bacon receptors, which we call square brackets R. The square brackets are often used to indicate the concentration of a molecule. And the ligand molecules that are free in the solution with concentration A. So the rate of association is therefore the proportionality constant, the association rate constant, times the free concentration of drugs, times the concentration of vacant receptors. The dissociation rate is a bit simpler because there's no drug concentration involved. All that's involved is the concentration of occupied receptors, square brackets AR. The, the, the bigger that is, the more molecules per second will dissociate, and the proportionality constant is the dissociation rate constant, so it's simply that. Now, at equilibrium, the dissociation rate is equal to the association rate. Of course, there are associations going on the whole time and dissociations going on the whole time. If you only had one molecule there, one receptor, you would see it, it jumping between the occupied and the unoccupied state. And it only looks constant because there's a large number of molecules involved as a rule. Uh, and so the fluctuations in the occupancy are small. And we can say that the association rate is equal to the dissociation rate at equilibrium. So we can define the dissociation equilibrium constant as the ratio of the dissociation rate constant to the association rate constant, and that will be equal to this ratio of concentrations of the equilibrium, equilibrium concentrations. So that's how you define the equilibrium constant. Now, the concentration of occupied binding sites and the concentration of free binding sites are a bit of a problem because what units do you put them in there? They're bound to a membrane. So do you express it per square centimeter of membrane or do you express the concentration uh, uh, per volume of the solution in which the membrane is contained. Well, it turns out not to matter because what we can use in place of the concentrations is the occupancy of the receptor, the fraction that are occupied. If you define the total concentration of receptors as R subscript tot, then the proportion of free receptors the occupancy of state two, say, will be R divided by R tot. And as long as these are in the same units and the units cancel out, and we just have the fraction of occupied receptors that are, that are, in this case, vacant, the proportion of free receptors. And that we, we use in place of the concentration. We divide the top and bottom of the definition of K by R tot, then we get K is A over P times P2 over P1. And that's how we, we do it in, in any case, however complicated. But let's stick now to the simplest case of a simple binding reaction, two states, 
of the binding site vacant and occupied with an equilibrium constant K. So this is their method I'm going to describe will turn out to be completely general, but we'll just do it for this simplest case in the first place. We number the states. One for the occupied state, two for the vacant state. Denote by P1 the fraction of receptors in the occupied state at equilibrium, sometimes called the occupancy of state one. Define as P2 the fraction of receptors in the vacant, not occupied state at equilibrium. And we notice that these occupancies must add up to one. That's pretty obvious because there's only two states the receptor can be in, vacant or occupied. So we now rearrange the definition of the equilibrium constant to get P1 on the left-hand side. So we multiply both sides by P1, divide both sides by K, and we get P1 is this ratio. And we can substitute that into P1 plus P2 equals 1, which we've already established. So P1 goes here, and that gives you that. Now, the only variable left is P2. We can take that outside the bracket and divide both sides by the stuff in the big bracket, and we get P2 is given by that. And so we've solved the problem. That's the fraction of unoccupied receptors. The fraction of occupied receptors we already established is this ratio times P2. So it's given by that. And that can also be written by this if you multiply top and bottom by K. And this is the famous Hill-Langmuir equation. It's actually more commonly known simply as the Langmuir absorption equation because it was derived by Irving Langmuir in 1919 or 1918 to describe the absorption of gases onto electric light bulb filaments. What he didn't know was that uh, 10 years earlier, A.V. Hill had derived the same equation in the Journal of Physiology to describe the binding of nicotine and curare to receptors. This was a at the time, A.V. Hill was a, a, a still an undergraduate. It said that he lived on the same staircase in Trinity College, Cambridge, with John Maynard Keynes and Bertrand Russell, which is pretty august company. So I'm going to introduce a bit of extra notation here, which will save us a lot of writing. If you look at these equations, even for much more complicated cases, you find that every time a, a free drug concentration occurs, it can be written as a ratio to an equilibrium constant. So let's just define that. We find C as the concentration of A, free ligand at equilibrium divided by its equilibrium constant. In other words, you express the concentration as a multiple of its equilibrium constant. So then you can just write the fraction of occupied receptors as P1 is C on C plus one. Very, very simple. And what it looks like is this. It's, a, it's actually part of a rectangular hyperbola it increases quite steeply at first, but it saturates really quite slowly. This is this dashed line here shows 
C equals one, because it's equals one, the occupancy is a half. But even at 20 times the equilibrium constant, well, the 20 times the equilibrium constant, the occupancy will be 20 over 21, which is uh, about 95% still isn't 100%. Well, of course, it'll never get to 100% because it, it would be asymptotic. The, this is usually plotted on a log scale. So when, when it becomes a sort of sigmoid looking curve and the, when the concentration is equal to its equilibrium constant, C is one and the occupancy is a half of the receptors are occupied. Now, it was Stevenson's brilliance that pointed out that this wasn't adequate to describe an agonist because um, his predecessors like A.J. Clark, for example, had assumed, because they had no option really, that the response will be proportional to the fraction of receptors occupied. But the fraction that are occupied will always tend to one. As, as the concentration increases, it, you can't do anything else. So that means all drugs should have the same maximum effect, and it, it's not in keeping with observations. Some drugs have a smaller maximum effect than others, some agonists. And in order to account for that, Stevenson included a term which he called efficacy, uh, but he made a mistake because and the, the nature of the mistake that he made was described in the last lecture of this series, affinity and efficacy explained. Um, the mistake essentially was that he didn't have any physical model in mind. It turns out that you can get an equilibrium constant for a competitive antagonist without knowing very much about the model at all. But the same, it doesn't work that way for an agonist. You've got to know something about the model to, to uh, get an equilibrium constant for an, ag an agonist. And as I pointed out in the last lecture, the simplest mechanism which will account for a for partial agonists is that proposed the year after Stevenson 1957 by Del Castillo and Katz in which case you have a binding reaction which is followed by an activation reaction so you've got three states not two altogether and this equilibrium constant for this activation reaction will describe the efficacy of the agonist, which is why it's called E. You might have the receptors fully occupied, but unless E is sufficiently big, they won't activate. And last time we just stated the result for the fraction of receptors in each of these states at equilibrium. But it's, in fact, it's easy to derive them and we'll just use the same method as we use for a two-state case. You number the states. State one is the active one. State two is the resting. But bound state, state three is the, the, re the, the resting but vacant confirmation. It doesn't matter how you number them, but as long as it's, you keep track of it. We denote as P1 the fraction that are active state at equilibrium at the occupancy of state one. We call P2 the occupancy of the intermediate state and state P3 is the fraction of vacant receptors at equilibrium. And we note, as before, that the occupancies must add up to one. But now three states, so P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals one. 
we define the equilibrium constants by the law of mass action, just as before. For binding, we use the dissociation equilibrium constant. So we denote as A, the concentration of free ligand at equilibrium. And we define that as a, a multiple of its equilibrium constant, the so-called normalized agonized concentration, because that saves a lot of writing. So the equilibrium constant for that first reaction was uh, the simple binding reaction was as before. It's given by this and we express the occupants, the concentrations of receptors as occupancy. So that becomes P3 over P2. And we get P2 on the left hand side as a multiple of P3 from that. And now we can just write as C times P3 to normalize concentrations. And we've got to do this similarly for each of the states. So the equilibrium constant for the isomerization reaction between occupied but inactive and occupied but active, that is P1 over P2, uh, that, that it, these are the equilibrium concentrations and so the equilibrium constant is P1 over P2 at equilibrium. We get P1 on the left-hand side. We see that it's E times P2. And P2, we know, is C times P3. So P1 is ECA times P3. So now... We've got everything in terms of P3. We can write that this sum, which we know to be one, is that which is P1, that which is P2, and P3 itself. We can now take the P3 outside the bracket, divide both sides by the stuff in the bracket, and we get the fraction of vacant receptors at equilibrium is one over this lot, or you can write it like that. And since we know the other things, P1 as a function of P3 and P2 as a function of P3, we can immediately write them down as well. So P2 was CA times P3, which is that. And the fraction of receptors in the active state is ECA times P3, which is this. Now, at very high concentrations, what does that become? Well, that will be the maximum fraction of open receptors, the maximum response. If concentration is very high, then this one on the bottom line becomes negligible. And the when that's uh, is the case, then the concentrations will cancel and we're left with E over E plus one. So that's the maximum fraction that can open. If E was one, then the maximum response would be 0.5. So that'd be a partial agonist. If E was 20, then the maximum response would be 20 over 20 plus one, which is just over point. Nine five ninety five percent of receptors in the active state is a very high concentration. It's always useful to think in terms of what concentration you need for half the maximum response or half the binding. Well, we've got expressions for P1, and we've got expressions for the maximum P1. So if we equate those to 0 0.5 and solve it for the concentration, we find that the EC50 for the response is K over 1 plus E. The EC50 for binding, it's a bit simpler because we don't have to um, 
the maximum binding is always one, so you can always occupy all of the receptors with a sufficient concentration. But the fraction bound is P1 at plus P2 because both of those species have agonists bound to them. And that comes to this. And when that's 0 0.5, then the concentration is the EC50 for binding, which is K over 1 plus E, exactly the same. The binding and the efficacy are inextricably mixed up, and you can't tell them apart from concentration response curves or, or from ligand binding curves. In fact, if we, this enables us to define a sort of effective equilibrium constant as K over one plus E, because that's the concentration at which you get half the maximum response and half maximum binding. So it, it behaves a bit like an equilibrium constant. It is a constant, but it depends on two equilibrium constants. K and E are called microscopic equilibrium constants because they refer to single steps in the reaction scheme. K effective, which involves both of them, is described as a macroscopic equilibrium constant because it defines what you see in some sorts of experiment it's a constant, but it's not. It doesn't describe a single step. It describes both steps. And for the binding curve, you can write the result simply as a over a plus kf. Sorry, that should be a square bracket. Um, that looks exactly like the. Hill-Langmuir equation, but the, the K effective is a mixture of both affinity and efficacy. So here are some uh, numerical calculations. If we say the efficacy is nine for the sake of example, so the maximum fraction in the active state is nine over nine plus one, which is 0.9 then you find the, the usual sigmoid curve. And this is for binding, so it's P1 plus P2. And that is, it's halfway, half the receptors are occupied when the concentration is K over 1 plus E, the K effective. Likewise, for opening or for activation, the maximum response is 0.9. In this case, half maximum is 0.45. The concentration required to produce that half maximum response is exactly the same, K over 1 plus E. So, this method can be used for any mechanism, however complicated. Uh, here's an example which I won't go through in detail, but it's fairly, uh, it'll just illustrate the fact that you can use it for any mechanism. We start by numbering the states again from one to 10, there are 10 states in this reaction. And the definitions of the equilibrium constants are used to express the, e each of the occupants is in terms of one of them, usually I choose P10, but you can use any one you like. And you can follow exactly the same scheme as before. And you define a normalized concentration. There are actually two different binding constants in this because the binding to the resting conformation it is assumed to be lower than the binding to this flipped or primed conformation of the receptor. It also differs from before in that the glycine receptor for which this is uh, 
was uh, our proposal combined three molecules. So this is the resting conformation along the top. That's with one molecule bound, two bound, and three bound. And we assume then that the, or we proposed that the resting conformation can move to a, a flipped conformation or primed conformation, which is necessary step on the way to its actually opening. And that the affinity for the, the this flipped or primed conformation is higher than for the resting conformation. And so this gives the cooperativity that's observed in the response without having to assume that the binding sites are not equivalent because the resting conformation has the same equilibrium constant for each of the three bindings. So, so does the flipped conformation, KF, for both of the bindings. But KF is smaller than KR, so the affinity is higher. And then each of these primed conformations can, can open. Um, we've got a choice of two different equilibrium constants for binding here, but if we define the normalized agonist concentration as a multiple of the dissociation equilibrium constant for the resting conformation, then you can apply the same constraint as before. There are now 10 occupancies. The fraction that are open at equilibrium will be the sum of the occupancies of state one, two, and three. And if you have a, a large piece of paper, you can work out that it comes to that. This is for P1, that's for P2, that's for P3. Sorry, that's for, that's for P1, that's for P2, and that's for P3. And there's 10 terms along the bottom corresponding to the 10 states. So that can impress your friends. But um, in fact, I had to work this out especially because there's no, uh, there's no need to use this method at all to get numerical results. But it's good to be able to do it in simple cases to see what's going on. The, you might be a bit puzzled by the, these factors of three that occur here. And they occur because there are three molecules bound. So if we take this first reaction here, the binding of the first molecule, there are three states, three binding sites vacant on this receptor. And so there's three chances for the molecule to associate, and that makes the association rate constant uh, has to be multiplied by three to allow for that. There's only one molecule bound here, so the dissociation reaction has uh, a dissociation rate of K minus one. So that divides the affinity for this step or the, the dissociation constant for this step is divided by three. For the second reaction, there's only two vacant sites on here. So the, the two vacant sites will be will mean that the association rate constant is multiplied by two. There are two molecules combined here, so either one can dissociate, which means the dissociation rate constant is also multiplied by two. So the KR, the, their ratio is just KR. Like, <coughs> likewise for the 
third binding, there's only one vacant state on 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 this. Two are occupied. One is vacant. So you have to. Uh, so the association rate for that site will be just k plus one. But there are three molecules here, which um, means that any one of them can dissociate, and that multiplies the dissociation rate k minus one by three. So the rate, the, the ratio of them is going to be three k r. And you have to put these constants in if there's more than one binding site, because without those constants, then the whole thing wouldn't reduce to a single uh, Langmuir equation when in the case where all the bindings were identical. That's a mistake that was made in Terry Kennekin's book, actually. He says that it's approximate, but it's exact if you include those so-called statistical factors. So what I'll do now is show you how in my programs, computer programs, occupancy is actually worked out, not by that method, because you'd have to do it separately for every mechanism, but by a method that involves a bit of matrix algebra. Now, not many pharmacologists, in my experience, know any matrix algebra. This is a great shame because it's the only way you can deal in a general way with problems of the rates of chemical reactions or even the equilibrium for chemical reactions. And so I've done a a 15 minute video, part of the UCL course playlist, which you can find on my YouTube channel, which describes basic algebra in 45 minutes. In fact, it's the only one of the series of 11 lectures I recorded on that topic that has many views. So I'll just describe quickly how you de derive equilibrium occupancies by this more general approach. And I'll use it in the example, the Del castillo katz mechanism again. This is written in terms of ion channels because the active state is the open state in that case. This is the Del castillo katz mechanism, but the arrows are labeled with the rate constants rather than the equilibrium constants because this method I'm going to describe is entirely general. It can be used to work out the rate of approach to equilibrium as well as the equilibrium properties. So K plus one is the association rate constant. Beta is the opening rate constant for the channel that's shut that's open and alpha is the shutting rate constant so we define a table that contains all of these rate constants this table has in the ith row and the jth column the rate of transition rate from state i to state j. So q12, first row, second column, is the transition rate from one to two, the shutting reaction. From two to one is beta, the opening rate constant. From three to two, third row, second column, is the rate constant for the binding reaction, the sort of zero first order rate constant, x is the concentration. So all the entries in this have to have dimensions of reciprocal time. 
and if the concentration doesn't vary with time, then this is a, a, a constant. Two and Q two three is the two to three is the dissociation rate constant. So this thing is called a Q matrix, and it's the it defines entirely the mechanism. If paths between states don't exist, then you have a zero there. There's no direct state from one to three or from three to one. So those have a zero entry. So this is the mechanism. This is the Q matrix for it, which describes it entirely. Let's put some numbers in. Say that alpha is a thousand reciprocal seconds, or oh, that's the same as one reciprocal millisecond. One over alpha is the mean life open lifetime of the channel. So that in this case would be one millisecond. The opening rate constant will say is 10,000 reciprocal seconds or 10 milliseconds to the minus one. And the ratio of those two is the equilibrium constant for the opening reaction, which is 10,000 over 1,000, which is 10. So that's the equilibrium constant for this efficacy step. The maximum response you see will be 10 over 10 plus one, which is about 90%. Say the dissociation rate constant is 8,000 reciprocal seconds or eight milliseconds to the minus one. And let's say that the, this, the association rate constant is five times 10 to the seven. So the equilibrium constant for the binding reaction is k minus one over k plus one, which is 0 0.00016 molar or 160 micromolar. Now we have to specify the free concentration of agonist as well. Say that's 100 micromolar. So the transition rate for the Q matrix is k plus one times the concentration, which is five milliseconds to the minus one. So now, now we have the Q matrix with numbers in it and we can do something with it. There's this Q matrix again. The calculation is described at more detail at 32 minutes, 50 seconds in lecture three of the UCL series on matrices for single ion channels. But I'll just whiz through it here to show that it can be done. Having got the Q matrix, you define a, a, a column and vector of ones. We augment Q by sticking that column vector of ones on the left, the right hand end of it. So we have a three row by four column matrix. We multiply S by its transpose, which gets us back to a three by three matrix. And we invert this and pre-multiply it by a row column vector of ones. And that gives us a row vector that contains the equilibrium occupancies. The equilibrium occupancies are called P infinity because in general, the occupancies vary with time. So they'd be, be written as P of T after an infinite time, they reach equilibrium. So we write the equilibrium occupancies as P infinity and they come out to be that. 79.4 in the active state 7.9 in the intermediate state and 12.7% vacant receptors. Th this expression looks odd, but its derivation is actually really quite sexy and it's dealt with, it's, it's outlined in the, um, the lecture that I just referred to, into really neat derivation. <laughs> 
Um, so we can we can do we can also of course do it by hand in this simple case. The maximum response is ten over ten plus one, which is ninety point nine. The normalized concentration is the free ligand concentration, 100 micromolar, divided by the binding constant, 160 micromolar, and that gives you 0.625. So the fraction in the active state comes out to be 0.794, exactly what we got from the matrix method. The fraction in the intermediate state is E fold less than that. So it's 0 0.0794. Again, what we got from the from the matrix method. And the fraction <coughs> that are occupied have a molecule bound to them is P1 plus P2, which is 0 0.873 in this case. And P1 divided by P1 max is this. That's P1, 0.794, P1 max is 90.9. So the response as a fraction of its maximum is 0.873, exactly as the occupancy is. They, of course, you can't in general observe what the maximum response is if you're just dealing with a whole tissue. You don't know what your maximum response is in terms of fraction of receptors that are occupied. If there's only one case I know where you can do it. You can, uh, in, un in favorable circumstances, determine it from single channel records by looking at the fraction of time for which a channel is open at very high concentrations. That'll give you an absolute value for P1 max, but you can't tell it from any other sort of experiment. Or in terms of the K effective, the, the K for the dissociation reaction was 160 micromolar, but the K effective, we've got to divide by E plus one, which is 10 plus one, which is, so, the effective affinity is much higher than 160. It's only 14.5 micromolar. That's because of the effective efficacy on the effective equilibrium constant. And in, in terms of K effective, we just have this Langmuir like expression, but with K effective, and that gives you 0 0.873, the same as here. It all works out very neatly. Okay, that's it, folks. You'll find in the comments below the video uh, the links to the references and the papers that I've referred to in the course of this talk. Have fun. <laughs>